So uh, today's topic is uh, applications of non-equilibrium uh, molecular uh, simulation techniques. Um, so I, I would like to um, talk about a few applications or a few examples that we've been working at uh, on the, the past few months in, in, our, in our group. Um, just to uh, um, try to put things in context a little, um, I'd like to first talk a little bit about molecular simulation. Um, I, would I, I think it's pretty fair to say it's, uh, it's a large field nowadays, uh, which is applied in, ma in many different areas of, of science in general, not just physics, but in other areas as well. Um, but I think there are two, two papers from the 50s that basically form the foundation of this, uh, of this field of science. The first one, uh, which is uh, the paper about Monte Carlo uh, techniques um, by Metropolis and, and uh, you know several co-authors, so Rosenbluth, Rosenbluth, Teller and Teller. Uh, I would say that the first and the last ones are, are the most famous guys. So uh, Edward Teller was you know a, a pretty famous guy in in, in U.S. and in um, in science in the national labs. Uh, actually, I did have the privilege to to see him still alive uh, many years ago when I was uh, was working at the, at the Lord's Livermore National Lab uh, laboratory and of course uh, Nick Metropolis so these guys basically uh, laid the foundation for what is known today as the Monte Carlo method I would say and you know it's like 20,000 citations which is you know it's a large number but still if you look at the applications that that are have been uh, um, worked on you know to this day, it's it's a relatively small number. So this is one of the papers that lays the foundation for a molecular simulation from 1953. So it's all just after the Second World War. Now the second one is about molecular dynamics, and which is a technique which uh, we have been mostly using. Uh, it's from 1959, um, so a little bit later. Uh, by Bernie Alder and, and, and Wainwright, it only has 1,500 citations, which is quite surprising if you look at the number of applications that has been published over the years. Um, but even so, Bernie Alder um, still won, rightly so, I would say, uh, the Boltzmann Medal in 2000. I can see it here, uh, 2001, I think he, um, he won that. So these are the two... I would say seminal papers that uh, laid the foundations for uh, molecular uh, simulation techniques, right? Um, so basically, so what is molecular simulation? So molecular simulation is a way of um, seeing the development of a, of a many particle system, be it classical or quantum, uh, based on certain interactions. So all of these simulations are um, have, have have a number of elements in common. So of course, you know, we have a physical system in which you have a certain number of particles, n particles. Uh, we have to describe the interactions between them. So that's always done in terms of some kind of a potential energy uh, landscape, and I put it in, in quotes here uh, because, of course, it's not real landscape. Uh, but it's it's described in terms of you know some kind of a function which uh, uh, describes say like a potential energy of the system as a function of particle position. So we have like you know n particles here. So we have like uh, n three dimensional positions. And in a simplified way, you can think of this thing as something like a like a landscape, right? Something like this picture we have here. So there's all kinds of like valleys and there's like mountains and mountain ridges and, and all this kind of thing. So uh, that's uh, why I, I refer to this as a landscape and, and this will come back sometime later as well, right? Now, in addition to these two things, it's always like we always have to do, we have to specify boundary conditions. So which in practice means we have some kind of a simulation cell, which is like a bounded region in space in which my particles are confined and there are different ways you can apply boundary conditions to this uh, region they can be either periodic which is a, a you know a, a common way of handling this or you can have like 
you know, fixed surfaces or you can have vacuum. It depends on, on the situation you uh, are interested in. And then uh, another very important point, and that's actually the one that refers to the two papers I just mentioned, is uh, how, how do you go about moving across this uh, potential energy landscape? So basically there are these two ways, these two papers describe conceptually different ways of sampling those uh, potential energy landscapes, these configurations from the system, which is either Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics. So Monte Carlo is a way in which you stochastically sample from this uh, uh, landscape. So it's like a, a Markov chain kind of approach, while molecular dynamics is essentially just integrating uh, Newton's equations of motion, right? So these are these two different uh, approaches to sampling this, uh, this landscape. And I would say um, Monte Carlo is more in the spirit of like Gibbs, Gibbs' view of statistical mechanics, talking about ensembles, while molecular dynamics is more like uh, Boltzmann's view of statistical mechanics, right? Now, uh, of course, uh, uh, a central ingredient in all the applications of molecular simulation uh, today uh, are relying on computational power. So uh, basically, like I said, like those two papers that I mentioned are from the 50s. And if you look at what was available then, um, so this is like a, a, there are two pictures which are from this maniac computer in Los Alamos from 1953. Um, so this is actually a nice picture. So this is uh, this is uh, uh, Robert Oppenheimer, and this is John von Neumann. So this computer was basically built on the ideas of John von Neumann in Princeton. Uh, and this computer in 1953, which did all kinds of engineering computations, uh, they it had like the opportunity, uh, the capacity of of doing like five to the ten to the four floating points operations per second. Right now, if you look at what the, uh, how this uh, uh, this computing power has evolved over the years, so if you we come to today, um, this in, in 2020, I think it's the the, the June top 500 list, which is the the most powerful computer on Earth nowadays. So it's this uh, Fugaku supercomputer in Japan, which has like eight times ten to the six. Uh, CPU cores, it has, has like 4 to the 10 to the 17 floating point operations per second. So in just less than 70 years, we have advanced like 13 magnitude, uh, orders of magnitude in terms of computing power. And obviously, this has made a huge uh, uh, influence on, on uh, what you can do with uh, molecular simulation techniques, right? So uh, just going back a little bit, uh, essentially what, what you do when you do these uh, molecular simulation uh, approaches uh, by sampling like this potential energy landscape being either Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics is you are really doing computational statistical mechanics. So it is numerical statistical mechanics. You are using uh, uh, statistical mechanical theories and you're sampling from the distributions in a numerical way, being it either uh, a stochastic approach from Monte Carlo or a de deterministic approach using molecular dynamics. But the idea is, okay, you want to somehow understand like a, a macro state of a system and you describe it in terms of many different equivalent micro states. So that's, that's the whole idea, right? And uh, as such, it has found, you know, widespread applications in many different fields. Uh, condensed matter physics, material science, uh, chemistry, and biology. Now, in most of these cases, I would say that people are interested in systems in equilibrium conditions. So, for instance, in material science, people are interested, okay, so what is like an equilibrium phase diagram of a system? Uh, in chemistry, you're looking at equilibrium situations in chemical reactions. Uh, in condensed matter physics, it's, it's very similar as well, right? Now, uh, non-equilibrium phenomena are much more complicated. Uh, we know that because statistical mechanics in equilibrium is well established, uh, but 
description of non-equilibrium phenomena is not as well established. And so that's actually an area in which these molecular simulation techniques can be uh, very useful. Uh, I'm just going to uh, give a few examples. So the first one I always like to mention, which is, I would say, like a hallmark development in uh, non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, is uh, Jarzinski's equality, which is a rigorous connection between equilibrium thermodynamics and uh, work distribution of processes that are arbitrarily far from equilibrium. So mathematically, it's like expressed like that. It is not really important what, what, what the, the detail of this expression is, but basically it says, okay, suppose you have like um, a system and you want to drive it into a different condition. So you have condition one and condition two or initial and final. And there is, say, a free energy difference between these two states of the system in equilibrium, right? Now, what this uh, equality states is, uh, what you can do is you can go to state one, from state one to state two, and do it in a driven way. So not in a reversible equilibrium way. So you can drive the system in a non-equilibrium fashion arbitrarily quickly, from one to two, and if you uh, record the statistics of the work that you do uh, going from one system to the other, and then you compute this exponential and you repeat this many times, you can show, or Jarzinski showed that, that if you take this exponential average over a distribution of non-equilibrium processes, you can relate this to an equilibrium property. So uh, molecular simulation has played a, a, uh, an important role in, in uh, establishing this, uh, this uh, relationship as well. Now, another uh, interesting case, actually very, very recent or actual, I would say, something that's very timely, uh, is about the physics of metastable states. Now, a particular example, and I will talk about it uh, uh, in, uh, later in one of the examples, is uh, metastable states of liquid water. So, so what I'm showing here is a title from a paper that came out last week. So it's November 20th, um, which is experimental observation of liquid liquid uh, transition in bulk supercooled water under pressure. So, so this work is basically related to um, the physics of liquid water when you cool it below the freezing point. So this is like a schematic. It's like a phase diagram uh, put together here by Greg Stewart from, from, from Slack. And it's like on the horizontal axis, like pressure. And on the vertical axis, you have like temperature. So in the high temperature regime, which means above the melting temperature, you have like stable liquid water. And then you cool it down and you can get super cooled water. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later. And there is a um, theory or there is a proposition that was, uh, uh, was put forth um, about some 20 years ago that there could be something like a critical point between two different liquid phases. That was a proposition in, in, uh, largely based on computer simulations. Now, coming back to this paper, uh, which is experimental, which is uh, it's really quite sophisticated, and they actually confirm, or at least their findings are consistent with this proposition that was put forth almost 20 years ago based on uh, um, molecular simulations. So uh, uh, it's very interesting to see that uh, molecular simulations are very useful also in, in non-equilibrium uh, simulations. Right. Okay, so uh, in our group, we've been working on, on uh, non-equilibrium situations as well. So in the remainder of, of you know, the, the presentation, I'd like to talk about two, uh, uh, two different uh, things we've been doing recently. Uh, one is, uh, is the first example. It's, again, talking about supercooled water. Uh, but in this case, we're going to talk about uh, rheology. So we are interested in seeing what happened or how we can characterize like flow in supercooled water. And this is something very recent that basically all the work was done by Ingrid de Almeida Ribeiro. I'm not sure if she's watching today. So she's a PhD student in my group 
and you know she has done all this uh, wonderful work and it was just recently published in uh, in physical review research this year so that's uh, that's the first example and the second one is is a quite a different uh, kind of problem um, which we basically rolled into by totally by accident which is uh, non equilibrium processes in purely repulsive binary fluids it sounds of kind of you know intimidating uh, but essentially, it is uh, something that in, in which we looked at what happens to uh, repulsive binary systems when you cool it really quickly from a high temperature uh, condition. And we essentially found something quite uh, unexpected. Uh, this was all done by Pedro Santos Flores, who was he was a, a PhD student of mine. He actually defended his thesis and. As soon as COVID permits, he will probably he will be moving to uh, the United States for for a postdoc. Okay, so let's let's go into uh, these two two cases. So the first case is like the rheology of supercooled water. So supercooled water is a metastable form of, uh, uh, of liquid water, and this this video is sh is showing something pretty familiar from our, our experience and frustrating, I would say. So, you know, you've been working all week and you're coming back home uh, on Friday night and you want to have a cold beer. I think this is Corona. This was not, uh, this is by accident, I think we put it in. Uh, anyway, so uh, you have like this, this cold beer sitting in the fridge. Uh, once it, come out, it comes out, it's still liquid. You could actually see it. Let's see if I can see if I can play it again. So once it comes out of the freezer, it is still liquid, but still uh, the temperature is already below the melting, uh, the, the freezing temperature. So the equilibrium situation should be ice. Now, when you have like some kind of a disturbance, like mechanical or what have you, suddenly it, it freezes. So that that's a characteristic of uh, supercooled water or any supercooled uh, substance, if you. Uh, if you want to look at it, okay. So uh, a lot is known about the structural properties. So uh, like this uh, experimental paper that I was uh, just showing, they actually do X-ray diffraction uh, on the structure in situ of this supercooled liquid. So they know a lot about the structural properties. Now, um, also from simulations, by the way, th those were the first that actually suggested this whole idea. Now. Uh, much less is known uh, about the flow characteristics because it's still a liquid, um, so there's flow properties, and that was a thing that no one has looked at before. So our thought was, okay, let's see if we can actually look at some of the flow characteristics of supercooled water, and to do that, we use uh, molecular simulation techniques. So just to uh, give a few technical details. So like I said before, there's a, there has to be a model that describes the interactions between uh, the components of your system. So in this case, we use something that's called uh, uh, TIP4P ICE, which is like just a code name for, for a water model. Uh, it was proposed in 2005, and it's actually, as far as known, one of the better uh, uh, water models. So it describes molecules as like rigid entities. So you're like an oxygen atom here, you got like the two protons. It is a rigid thing. So uh, the distance between oxygen and, the, and the hydrogen are fixed as well as the angle between those two, say, uh, covalent bonds. Uh, there's charges on different positions of, on this molecule. So they're like charges centered on the two protons. Um, let's see, so this is, these are the values, so like 0.58 um, electron charge, and the oxygen charge is actually displaced from the oxygen itself, so it's sitting here at this site M. So that's why there is like this number four, because there are like four sites in this. Now, so this is electrostatics, and in addition, there is like a um, interaction between the oxygens in, from different molecules, which is basically described by Leonard Jones. Now, this model has shown to be, give a pretty good description of, of the phase diagram, of the equilibrium phase diagram. And also its melting temperature is pretty good. So it's like 271. So it's only about two Kelvin off from uh, the, the right experimental value. 
Right. So, okay, so we need a computational cell, like I said. So in this case, we use a cell that contains 10,800 molecules. Uh, we use periodic boundary conditions, which means, um, so if you go abroad, you look at the cell here. So this molecule is essentially saying, seeing this molecule through the periodic boundary conditions that wrap around in all three directions, right? Um, we're going to use molecular dynamics, which means we're integrating equations of motion and we control temperature by using Langevin dynamics, which is like another technical um, instrument to uh, simulate something like a constant temperature. Now, since we have electrostatics involved, we need to do something to handle like the long range character of it, which is done uh, using this particle, particle, particle mesh method, which is, you know, another technical uh, element. And all this was done you know, uh, uh, using the LAMPS MD code, which is, uh, which is free and uh, has a lots, lots of, of interesting things and um, features. And so, so what do we do to actually induce flow in this? So uh, what we do is we impose a time dependent shear strain. So how do you do that? So on the left here, we have this picture of the cell in a original shape. So this is 2D, of course it is 3D because we have like depth on the third dimension going in, inside the paper slide. Now what we do is we deform this cell. So in this, in this picture, we kind of have sheared the cell by a certain amount delta in this direction along the shearing direction. And then you can define something that's known as a shear strain, which is defined as, we use it like the symbol gamma, which is delta over L. So it's this distance here by which you have sheared the top layer by the, the thickness of the layer. Now, you can do this with different velocities. So in this case, we impose certain uh, fixed velocity, which means that this delta here increases with a, a, a fixed velocity in time. And uh, correspondingly, what you have is you have a certain strain rate, uh, which is strain per unit time, uh, which is this gamma dot, which then basically is V over L. So this thing has like units of uh, time to the minus one, right? Now, so when you do this, uh, you, you, you get pictures like this. So this is an image. It's basically a slice along the, the, the third dimension, right? Just to be able to see something um, of a simulation in which we have supercooled water and we just deform it in this way. The colors correspond to by how much molecules move along the process uh, in, a certain, in a certain way. It's not really important, uh, uh, the exact definition. So the arrows show the same kind of information. So they show by how much molecules move along this shearing shearing process now uh, of course uh, we don't only want to make movies which is nice but uh, we would like to quantify things so what we do here is we try to see what the resistance against the flow is as a function of the deformation so effectively what we're doing here is we are uh, monitoring uh, the quantity, which is the shear stress. So you can imagine that we are trying to deform a system very much like you you like to, uh, you deform a spring, All right? So you try to extend or or uh, con uh, compress a spring. There will be a force which is acting against it. Now in this case, we are in a slightly more general situation, 3D. So uh, when we are trying to impose strain. Uh, the system tries to oppose the, that uh, modification, and that's quantified in terms of uh, the shear stress, right? So uh, what I'm plotting here in this graph here, so on the horizontal axis, we have this strain, which is basically the degree of deformation. You go from zero, there's no deformation to a value. In this case, it's 0.7, but we actually go to many, uh, to larger values. And on the vertical axis, we have the, the shear strain, the, the shear stress actually. So it's kind of uh, uh, the, the force response of the system. Now, the interesting thing is that the response is non-monotonic, meaning there are different stages in this response. So let's just focus on this uh, magenta curve here, which is the one on the top. So 
uh, for low values of the strain, you can see that this kind of this thing is almost like linear. So, which means uh, the stress is increasing linearly with the strain. So, which is very much like uh, you have the spring, linear spring. Um, the the force increases linearly with um, the deformation or like the extension, right? So this is kind of Hookian behavior. Now, as the deformation increases, what you can see is that this thing starts bending off. So it becomes nonlinear and there is actually a maximum here. So there is a, like a stress maximum, uh, which we in many cases also is called something like a yield stress. It's it's kind of like the system is no longer able to uh, withstand the stress that the strain that's being uh, applied and the system basically yields. And after that, it basically starts to decrease again and then you get into something like a steady state. And when that, when that happens, you have something like a steady state flow situation um, in which there is some kind of a stress that you need in order to maintain uh, this, the deformation going. Now, you can see also that uh, the curves are different with different strain rates. So these different colors here, so the green, red, and all that, they correspond to different velocities in which we are deforming the system. So this magenta one is the one that's uh, um, the largest uh, deformation rate and the green one is the slowest interesting you see that in the green one there's not even like a maximum so it basically goes immediately to a stationary state in any case this kind of behavior in which you have like a, a linear uh, initial behavior then there's like a maximum and then you relax to a steady state that's kind of what's called viscoelastic behavior so in the beginning there's like elastic behavior and then it goes to uh, the processes that lead to this is like viscous relaxation and in the end you have like a, a, a viscous flow, right? So this kind of not very common, I would say, in, in systems like that. You usually have this in like polymer systems and things like that, right? Now, uh, one thing that we can look at here is, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's look at what happens in the stationary state, right? The stationary state is once the system has uh, overcome this yield stress and uh, we can actually look at what is the stress that's necessary to maintain the flow going at this rate that we're imposing. And if we do that, then we can basically define the shear viscosity. So the shear viscosity, which is a function actually of the strain rate, as we will see, um, is defined as the ratio of the stress that you need to impose, which is the sigma infinite, which is basically the steady state value, divi divided by this uh, the imposed strain rate, right? Now, so here we are plotting that for different strain rates, okay? So on the horizontal axis, we have different velocity of deformation. So this is the value of this, uh, this viscosity. And we have three different curves, blue and the green and the red, which correspond to different degrees of supercooling. Remember, we're looking at this uh, for temperatures below the melting point, right? Um, so one thing that's kind of uh, what we were expected is as you cool and you go to lower values of the, of the deformation, uh, look at this, you know, the, these plateaus here, uh, um, the the viscosity goes up. So uh, um, if, if you cool down a liquid further, it will be harder to actually make it flow. So that's uh, something that's kind of obvious. Now, um, the more interesting thing though is, is like this. So if you look at these curves, for instance, if you look at the blue curve, which is the one at the lowest temperature, 45K below melting temperature, there are two very different regimes there. Um, for the lower flowing rates, so at this end of the of the plot, it goes to like a constant. Now, whenever the viscosity is independent of the flow rate, that's called Newtonian behavior, Newtonian viscosity. So there's some kind of a low deformation limit value for this viscosity, which is known as the Newtonian limit. Now, 
if you go to higher rates, you see that the viscosity actually depends quite strongly on, on deformation rate, and that's called a non-Newtonian flow regime. The viscosity depends on now increases with the flow rate, which is known as something called shear thinning, right? Shear thinning is actually but implying a certain flow rate and as you do that uh, it becomes thinner and it becomes more easy to actually flow right but paint is something much more much more complicated than water in in the sense of molecular structure right um, so it's kind of uh, kind of interesting right now uh, is there a way we can actually quantify this and model this? Because these are just a raw simulation data. So these curves you see, so the, so the squares and the circles and, the, and triangles are actually uh, molecular dynamics data. And these curves are actually fits to a, a phenomenological model, which is called the Carot model, which is a model that was developed by, by Carot in 1972 um, to model a crossover between a Newtonian regime and a non-Newtonian shear thinning regime. And uh, it's like this, this expression. So this is uh, uh, the, um, the value of the shear viscosity as a function of the strain rate. Uh, this is the Newtonian value, right? And this gamma uh, dot zero is known as the crossover rate. So it's kind of an estimate of where this behavior crosses from a constant to something that's not a constant. And this N here is a thinning exponent. So it's interesting to see, this is a log log plot, right? So the non-Newtonian re regime is actually a power law. That was actually predicted by this model and which seems to fit very well for, um, for supercooled water, right? Uh, actually, the, so we can actually learn something about the interactions between water molecules from this, because this Carot model is based on an idea that the flow is um, a stress-assisted process for a, a potential energy landscape that has many different barriers between minima. So remember this... Um, this landscape that I was drawing in the beginning. So it's like formed by many minima, they're maxima, they're like saddle points and all that. Um, different kinds of uh, energy landscapes give, different, give rise to different kinds of behavior. And uh, so in this case, Carot's model assumes there's like a distribution of different barriers. So this is like a minimum, this is another one. And there is like a barrier to go from this guy to the other guy or uh, to go from this guy to the other guy, there's an, a different barrier. So there are different kinds of barriers. Once you apply stress, essentially this whole thing tilts, right? So that, that's why I, I, I draw this um, this dashed line here, it basically tilts and the barriers essentially uh, change. So the fact that our data uh, actually are very fitted very well by this Corot model indicate that uh, in the case of water, the potential energy landscape is really something like this and not a potential energy landscape in which there is one predominant barrier. If you would do that, you would not get something like a power law dependence here. Um, another thing that's interesting to, to, to show, you can actually see it here, is uh, as the temperature decreases, so this is a higher temperature, this is the intermediate temperature, and this is the lowest one. Um, this thing decreases more strongly with temperature compared to higher uh, to the higher temperature, which means there is a, a stronger thinning effect with decreasing temperature. Now, there is another uh, uh, interesting relation, which is uh, the relation between the Newtonian value of the of the, um, the viscosity, which is basically this plateau value, right? And uh, the rate at which you have the crossover between the Newtonian and non-Newtonian 
uh, regime. So kind of like this here and this here and this here. So if you look at this plot, so it plots these two, one as a function of the other, and there seems to be like a power law uh, relation between the two, and which is kind of interesting because it relates a non-equilibrium property with an equilibrium property, and it's still not quite not clear uh, what's going on here. So that's that's um, a topic for for further uh, investigation. Okay, so that that's one one application. Oh, this oh this is another one. Before I go on, uh, um, what what is actually the molecular origin of the shear thing, right? So why does this um, the viscosity actually go down as you increase the, the the strain rate? And so what we do is we actually looked at the uh, the connectivity of the hydrogen bond network uh, that uh, basically gives the the cohesion in the system. And so what you see here, again, these are the different temperatures. So the blue is the coldest one, the, the green is the intermediate, and the red is the uh, uh, the highest temperature. On the horizontal axis, we're plotting the strain rate. So this is these are the low values, these are the high values. And this is the number of hydrogen bonds normalized to what it is in equilibrium, right? So when we're not doing any deformation. And you can see that for the lowest temperature, uh, the number of hydrogen bonds per molecule is actually uh, decreasing with strain rate. And this effect is more is stronger as the temperature goes down. So which means that as you deform it, the connectivity of the hydrogen bond network is reducing progressively. And uh, it's essentially clear that is basically due to a time scale difference between how fast you, the deformation you, you impose is progressing and how long it takes for molecules to actually um, adjust to that. So it's, in that sense, it's pretty similar to if you look at like polymer systems in which there are certain timescales for polymer change to align with uh, um, imposed deformations. Okay, so that's the example one. Now, so now we go to example two, uh, which is, is, is quite different. So uh, uh, it involves uh, non-equilibrium process in purely repulsive binary fluids. So like I said, that was published this year by, by uh, work done by Pedro Santos Flores in his PhD thesis. Um, so uh, what are we looking at here? So we're looking at systems, classical systems, that are described by purely repulsive interactions, uh, which means that if you look at like uh, their pair potential, so the potential energy of interaction of, between a pair of particles, is described by some kind of function which is always repulsive. So there's no there's no attraction whatsoever, right? So uh, um, these systems are of interest from a fundamental statistical mechanical point of view, but they're also serve as effective models for like soft matter. So you have these things that are known as like star polymers uh, that interact effectively uh, in in this way. So. Uh, these are not interactions on an, on an atomic scale. So this is like on a, on a meso scale, uh, but this kind of interaction has been used to model interactions of this kind of, of system. So they're purely uh, uh, repulsive. Uh, so in, in, in this kind of system, these like, uh, like star polymers and colloidal kind of systems, uh, something that's really interesting is always like the spontaneous development of structure. So you uh, initiate the system in some kind of highly disordered state, and then you let the system evolve and see what happens. Right? And like a typical example in, 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 in physical systems or even in metallurgy, what people do is, so you heat a system up to a really high temperature, and then you quench it really quickly to see what happens. So it's a, it's a, a fundamentally out of equilibrium process. And uh, from from uh, from this field of non-equilibrium phase transitions, there are basically there are two kind of known transitions. One is you can either either have phase separation because we're looking at binary mixtures in this case, or something like structural ordering. Uh, and as far as we could tell until today, we did not see any system that could actually do both, either like separate phase or uh, uh, show some kind of structural ordering, right? So uh, that's what we try to do here. So we investigate like a quench response 
in these binary repulsive fluids using molecular simulations. And we actually use a bunch of different models. So not just one, but a bunch of different ones that has been used in the past. So one is called this Uhlenbeck Ford model. Um, the main thing is it has like a logarithmic divergence. So you can really squeeze two particles together by a lot and the energy doesn't grow by very much. Uh, like the inverse power law potentials are, you know, very known. So they, they're actually part of the, like the Leonard Jones um, repulsive part, although it's always 12 here when you do it for the Leonard Jones. This is known as like the, the Weeks Chandler Anderson model. And this is a Gaussian core. So the expressions are not very important. Uh, but if you look at, at the graphs, so this Uhlenbeck Ford is something like this black curve. So it's, you know, purely pros, of course, and it really diverges really slowly. Now you have this IPL4, IPL6, which diverge at the origin. Um, the one in six, of course, goes faster than four. And then you have this Weeks Chandler Anderson, which essentially is the repulsive part of the Leonard Jones, which diverges really quickly. And then there's this other case, which is called the Gaussian core, which is interesting, which uh, uh, actually does not diverge at the origin, actually goes to a constant value. So we looked at these uh, different models here. Okay, so let's see what happens. So what we do is we take the system like we have done, uh, tested many different sizes. So 10 to the five, 10 to the eight particles. Uh, it's always 50% A type, 50% B type. So they're symmetric binary mixtures. Uh, we always start off with a random initial structure, which means we take this box, something like you see here, randomly throw in the particles. That, that's our initial condition. And then we look at the energy scale. So if you go back to this these expressions, so you have like, uh, these epsilon ij's and sigma ij's, these are inter energy parameters and length scale parameters for interactions between different species. So A and A, B and B, and A and B. So in our case, we fix them at epsilon AA is 100, and epsilon BB is 200, it's kind of arbitrary. Uh, but epsilon AB is variable, which means that we can tune the interaction between unlike species. And for this case, we just set the length scales uh, for all interactions to be the same. Okay, and then what we do, so like I said, we take a random initial structure, which nothing else is but an ideal gas, right? So energies are not important. Uh, you just throw in a random uh, um, configuration, which will be resented, representative of an ideal gas uh, situation. And then what we do is energy minimization. So we basically look for the local minimum, energy minimum closest to that initial uh, configuration. Uh, and all this was all implemented again in, in the LAMPS code. So we are actually looking for a local minimum. So what we're doing here is we're doing a uniform sampling of potential energy minima, which are also called inherent structures. This name will I will use that again soon. So basically, you know, throw in particles uh, randomly and minimize and find what is the local minimum closest to that initial condition. Okay. So let's have a look at this Uhlenbeck Ford model, which is the one with the, um, with the um, logarithmic divergence. So in this case, this interaction parameter between unlike species is 175, which is right between uh, the one between A and A and, and um, B and B. And what happens is if you just minimize this, uh, this initial structure goes to a phase separated structure, which is a mechanism known uh, uh, in metallurgy, which is called spinodal decomposition. So there's like this, I think this animation. So this shows a few snapshots of how this goes on. Now I should say that the configuration that I was showing in this box is actually not the local minimum because the local minimum would be the configuration in which you have, say, blue on top and red on the bottom totally separated. But in order to achieve that, you would have to go a very long way, which is basically you cannot achieve that, right? Okay, so that's what happens when you have a relatively strong interaction between A and B. So essentially, the, you know, A and B don't like to stay together, right? Now, if you go to some a, a lower value, like 160 in this case, so essentially what happens is nothing much happens. So it basically relaxes locally, 
but the I, the final structure is still amorphous. So it's it's kind of homogeneous, and there's no obvious uh, structure there, right? Now, if you do something else, which is now go to a small value. So in this case, I'm saying epsilon a b uh, is 20, and then that was something really curious. So you go from a totally random initial structure and then you minimize it and you're looking for the local energy minimum that's closest to that initial condition. And what we see is a crystal structure. Well, in this case, it's going to be, it's a polycrystal structure. You can kind of see it already here that's involved, uh, that's developing. So this is after minimization, which means the closest local minimum to a disordered configuration is actually a crystal configuration and it's particular it's the rock salt structure so it's the same structure as a uh, table salt so um, there's this animation here uh, you can kind of see it going here it's kind of slow uh, but you can see the, the the crystal structure developing slowly so it's going you can already see these kind of domains uh, developing. Now, the interesting thing is, so what we're having here is we're going from some kind of a disordered phase, like a high temperature phase, but we're going to a crystalline phase, right? Um, and guys, let's uh, actually just summarize until this moment. So we're going from something that's totally disordered, ideal gas, and depending on the value of the interaction between A and B, I can either phase separate or stay in a, an amorphous phase or, or go to a crystal. And all that's controlled by the magnitude of the interactions between the different species. Now, going back to the final one, so th this crystallization interaction. So uh, th this actually shows a little bit better what's going on. So uh, in this case, we've just colored it a little bit differently. So instead of coloring different species like red and blue, now we're actually looking at the structure and you can clearly see uh, like the like the purple are the the crystal grains that are are developing uh, uh, in the system and you can clearly see it goes from a totally uh, unstructured or, or or amorphous initial phase let's see all that's white is basically structureless and all that's purple uh, is actually according to to this structure so uh, now the interesting thing about this is because when you think about uh, like f something like a freezing uh, transition like you have here you go from water to ice or or any other uh, crystallization um, process it is a first order phase transition which happens by uh, nucleation and growth now in this case that's not what's going on it, uh, so in this case the crystallization is actually continuous in nature uh, why is that? Because what I'm doing here is I'm starting off with a random configuration and then I'm minimizing, which means I'm just finding the local minimum that is closest to the initial condition, which means there are no barriers between the initial configuration and the final configuration, or there is no nucleation or growth. There is no temperature assisted process in which you form a nucleus that then grows to form a new phase. And interestingly, there's some other data which, uh, which show support of that is, so what we did was, uh, so you look at this picture and you can actually look at the statistics of the grains here. So you can look at, okay, let's count the grains uh, and look at the sizes of them, All right? So what we did was, okay, so we took this huge cell, like 10 to the eight particles, uh, we did this simulation, then determined the statistics of the grains, and then determined something that's uh, uh, something that's called like a rank size plot. So uh, basically, what you do is you rank the grains in sizes. So number one is the one that has the largest size, number two the second largest, and so on. And if you plot that, you get like this curve. So we had like. Uh, 30,000 different grains in the system. Uh, the smallest grain had a size that was like, you know, a little more like than 100. And the largest one, which had like, uh, like 80,000 particles or something. Now, the interesting thing is, 
asymptotically, this distribution actually seems to go to seems to be going to power law, um, actually with like this exponent, which means uh, this is typical of the things that occur in equilibrium second order phase transitions. This is a non-equilibrium second order phase transition. At least that's what we believe it is. But I mean, it's very interesting to see this kind of scale free behavior occurring, which means that the final kind of structure of grains uh, should be scale free, which is an indication of the second order nature of this uh, transition. Now, uh, this was just one case, right? So what we do is, okay, so how does this depend, this behavior on the density, because we all do that at fixed density, and also as a function of this parameter, the interaction between A and B. So how do we actually uh, uh, monitor this? So you can imagine if you go from a random system to a, a, a totally phase separated system, the particles have, have to move by a lot. If you go to the crystal phase, they have to move by somewhat, but maybe not as much. And if you go to an amorphous phase, basically the particles hardly move. So they basically change a little bit with respect to their initial condition. So what we did was, okay, so let's compare by how much the particles move from the initial condition to the final condition. And that's what this plot is showing here. So on the horizontal axis, we have the interaction parameter epsilon AB. This is the density and the colors correspond to amounts of by how much particles have moved on average. So this color bar basically shows you by how much. So red is really small. So this is in units of average particle spacing. So you see clearly three regimes here. So there's like the yellow for the smaller values. You got this bluish for the larger values and this amorphous in between. So this is, in this region, you see this continuous crystallization occurring. For the high values, you see phase separation, and in the middle, it's basically amorphous, right? So you can see these transitions are pretty abrupt. So it means that depending on the value that you, that you choose for this epsilon AB, um, the topography of the potential energy landscape actually changes radically from something that has crystalline minima to something that has amorphous minima to something that has like phase separated minima. And also interesting to see, there does not hardly seem to be any dependence on the density. So if you go to higher densities or lower, of course there's a limit because if you go to really low densities, the particles basically don't interact anymore, right? Um, but this is also an interesting point to see. Now, what about the other models? So this here is the same kind of plot like the one I showed you before, but then for the different models. So the, the first one is the same one I showed on, on the previous slide. So this is the crystalline region, this is amorphization, this is phase separation. And then we go to these different other models. So the inverse power law four, it shows, this, it shows the same kind of behavior. So you, you see crystalline region, amorphous, and phase separated. For the inverse power law six, it's the same. But interestingly, you can see that this the width of this band is starting to decrease. And if you go to this WCA, which is this model which rises really quickly, uh, there is a tiny, tiny little bit. You can see at the scale here, it's so like for uh, uh, epsilon less than two on this scale, it goes to a thousand. You see something, but otherwise you see nothing. And then uh, also interestingly for this Gaussian core, which does not diverge, there's only very tiny little area in which you do see this continuous crystallization occurring. The remainder is either uh, amorphous structure or um, this phase separated structure. So interestingly, so the propensity for this like continuous crystallization is correlating with the behavior near the origin. If it goes slowly, like in Uhlenbeck Ford, uh, there's a broad band of crystallization. And as the, uh, the divergence increases, goes more rapidly, this crystallization goes away with the ultimate case of the Gaussian core, which is only a little tiny, uh, tiny little band. We still do not know exactly why it's only this region. So that's something that's still being um, looked at. So just to summarize now, I think I'm, I'm out of time now. Uh, uh, so we, we looked at two things uh, using molecular simulation for, for non-equilibrium uh, uh, processes. So looking at the rheology of super cold water, 
So we've seen that it, it has a viscoelastic kind of response. So it's, it's kind of something that you expect for more complex liquids like polymer melts and things like that. Um, there's a clear Newtonian to shear thinning crossover. And this crossover is due to the reduction of the uh, hydrogen bond network connectivity. And then the, the, the second example was like the, this non-equilibrium decay of purely repulsive binary mixtures, which shows two different kind of ordering transitions. So uh, it can be either phase separation or crystallization. And in between there's a region in which not, not very much happens. It's interesting to see that this is a barrierless crystallization process, meaning it's not like the usual first order nucleation and growth process. Of course, this is far from equilibrium. That's something that we should always keep in mind. And it's also it seems to be general for repulsive pair uh, potentials uh, with the uh, propensity for this, this uh, continuous crystallization uh, transition to occur. Uh, it depends on how the potential behaves uh, at the origin. And uh, that's what I'd, I'd, I'd like to show you today, and uh, I'd, I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Maurice. Are there any questions? Uh, hi. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay. We, can, uh, we can hear you. Yes, because uh, Mauricio said that uh, they studied sh shear viscosity and also viscosity. But uh, I don't know whether they use correlation function or how they calculate exactly. So, okay, so correlation functions are, are something that you use in equilibrium cases, right? Oh, so the, the relation between, uh, like, it's like a green Kubo kind of relation between a, a shear viscosity and uh, uh, correlation functions. So we've actually looked at that as well for the Newtonian regime. But in this case, we really compute viscosity by uh, the definition, which is a ratio between a shear stress and a strain rate. Right. So this is all out of equilibrium. So in this case, we do not use correlation functions for this out of equilibrium regime, basically. And another question is this, uh, you talk in one slide about uh, the phase, uh, uh, about the case that uh, in, this, in this system, we can whether have uh, ordering or whether have uh, phase separation. Right. And, uh, this order is only for crystallization or other kind of order, for instance, magnetic ordering? So um, I would say that if you look at the phase separated phase, mostly there is no overall crystalline orders. There's some localized ordering, but there's no uh, long range structural ordering like you see in the crystallization process. So it's mm -hmm. really uh, so in one case, you have like ordering in terms of A, A staying together with A and B, together, uh, B staying together with B. Uh, and in the other case, the system is homogeneous chemically. So the, uh, the composition is uniform in terms of A and B, but there is structural order in terms of crystallization. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, okay. Are there any other questions? Uh, I was a bit curious on uh, what is special about uh, water in this case. Uh, in, in which case, you say? Uh, this uh, phenomenon of supercooling, I mean, how general uh, is it of uh, liquids uh... well uh, well certainly i mean it's uh i would say it had not been investigated for for supercooled water so far um 
I guess one of the interesting things is uh, the fact that it matches so well this Caho model, which means that the potential energy landscape underlying the flow, uh, at least the dynamics underlying the flow, can be described in terms of a potential energy landscape which has different ver various barriers with different heights. Right? If you go to a different kind of model, like the Iring model, in which there is one uh, energy barrier, uh, you would actually see a different behavior for for larger strain rates, which would not be a power law. Mm -hmm. Right. So in that sense, at least for this potential, it gives you some insight on uh, the, the potential energy landscape that's that's originating here or originate this kinds of behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was also surprised by the time scales uh, that the uh, rate uh, gamma presented because you had gamma uh, of order 10 to the 11th uh, sure. second month. Yeah, we, 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 uh, can, we could go to 10 to the 6. They're always large. They're always very high, right? They're always large. Um, uh, this is not the time scales I would ex I mean uh, I would expect for this uh, kind of uh, I don't know to say it, this kind of dynamics uh, uh, I mean it surprised me by how fast it is uh, uh, how to say uh, because it means that you the frequency involved are 10 to the minus uh, 10 to the 11 uh, Hertz it's uh, doesn't it sound extremely fast? They are. They are extremely fast. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, uh, that's always something that we have when we're looking at um, like a simulation because the time scales are always uh, connected to, say, the atomic frequencies, right? So we're always looking at uh, like uh, like high frequencies, right? So okay. um, it's really hard to get any direct experimental comparison to this. There are some experiments in which people can actually go to really high strain rates, right? Maybe not mm -hmm. 10 to the 11 or something, but 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 is something that can be reached in certain situations. I'm not saying in this case, right? That's something that remains to be seen. But I mean, it's, you know, those difficulties are always there. And uh, uh, what was the example, the, the example for super cool water? Uh, this region in which these experiments were done that were reported last uh, last week, uh, people said, you know, we can never get there because there are all kinds of problems with time scales and uh, crystallization time scales, and they actually got there. So, I mean, certainly it's going to be hard to yeah. to, uh, to compare it immediately with experiment, uh, but it may be interesting. Maybe something is possible in the future. Who can tell? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. As I say, expected much uh, lower time scales. Well, I mean, if, if you go to molecular type simulations, it's, we can if we let the simulation run for like 10 years or so, then, then we could, but otherwise it's, it's, kind of, it's impossible. We will get quantum computers before that. Yeah, let's, well, well, we'll see about that. We'll see about that. <laughs> Are there more questions? Okay. There is one question in the chat, I think. Ah, sorry, I didn't. Uh, okay, someone was asking. Oh, there was, there's a chat, right? Uh, sorry, yeah, in the chat. Uh, how can you modify experimentally the values of epsilon a b for a fixed for position? Well, I mean, certainly. So, uh, especially in like the colloid community, they are very uh, skilled at tuning these the interactions between particles. So we're not talking about like atoms anymore. So it's really on a, me a measure scale between. Uh, you know, large size particles that interact effectively between uh, uh, among each other, and they can actually tune interactions between them. You know, these effective interactions. So, in that sense, that's what the role of this epsilon AB could be. Um, so, um, 
I don't know how they do it, but I'm, I know that they are very skilled at it, especially in this colloidal uh, pollutants. They have ways of effect tuning interaction between the, the colloidal particles. Mm -hmm. Okay, the other question about the, uh, the phase diagram. Uh, I don't know. Because, well, in this case, I assume you're you're referring to the ex, uh, the equilibrium phase diagram um, for the system. Um, certainly, that's going to be a, a complex uh, operation to do that. But you know, you, you you can actually compute those things. So it's just like any binary uh, system you have in metallurgy with all kinds of. Uh, uh, coexistence lines and eutectics and liquids and all kinds of different phases. So uh, how it actually specifically affected in this case, I don't know, we didn't do that calculation. Mm 